Martin, you just came back from others where you participated in the Joint Ministers' Conference of Agriculture that had a very nice theme to it, transforming Africa's agriculture for shared prosperity. At NEPAD, you're responsible for CADEP. Um, what were your takeaways, the most important takeaways for CADEP, if you consider that frame? What was the outstanding outcome of, of this meeting is actually three things, and I would look at the process and also the final outcome. One is that uh, everyone acknowledged the quality of the discussions, of the, the depth of uh, the analysis that, in fact, the experts brought to the whole discussion around the, the next 10 years of CADA. You remember that uh, the, the minister's conference was uh, organized around the uh, making clear decisions, recommendations to the heads of state coming up in June on what should be the priorities, what should be the strategies for CADAP over the next 10 years. Number two is that ultimately the meeting all the way to the ministers agreed on very clear seven points as part of what should the member states commit to. The first one was uh, recommitting to the principles and the values of CADA. Number two was uh, committing uh, or recommitting to the principles around 10% uh, public expenditure into agriculture. Uh, number three was the commitment to zero hunger, and this is uh, ultimately uh, the impact we're looking at. And of course, in here, we also articulate the issue of nutrition which is very important, and actually recognizing the implications or the adverse impact of malnutrition on the development. And the fourth one is on the trade and market. And here again, you are looking at uh, the whole aspect that links agriculture to markets, agriculture to trade. And this is also articulating issues of not just production and productivity, but also value addition in terms of agro-industry. And the, the fourth one uh, was actually the issue of resilience. And this is looking at social systems, looking at uh, environmental resilience, actually responding to uh, uh, shocks such as climate change, uh, land degradation, but also just the stability in social systems that is actually complex. Uh, arrangement that relates to, to various factors. Uh, and finally, there was also a very clear agreement and endorsement of the results framework. You spoke a lot about uh, the commitments already, so it's good to see that there was consensus around that. Was there also uh, decisions on uh, strategies for the next decade or flagship initiative? The results framework is actually articulated around the two major thrusts. One is, the, is the, the transformational change that we need to see. And this is in the context of capacity, systemic capacity, in the context of, of change in the way we do business. On the other side is the actual value addition, the actual uh, wealth creation. And this is looking at production, productivity directly. And here we look at uh, uh, actually in that decision on the, on the interregional trade, the meeting also agreed on identifying a set of commodities and value chains, and around those commodity value chains actually enhance and develop the level of trade that we were talking about. From your perspective, who are the main drivers for change in CADEP and African agriculture? I think one fundamental thing that has been realized over the last 10 years and building up over time is the recognition of partnerships and alliances and, and the whole practicality of multi-sectoralism. And here in terms of drivers of change, we see very clear acknowledgement by public sector and private sector on the role that both of them need to play in, in complementarity, in leveraging each other to actually be the energy that should make the, the action. So the, the whole alignment 
and the strengthening of cooperation and alliances between the public sector and the private sector is going to be an important part of the success for, or the, the equation that should deliver success. Uh, that is one. But there is also recognition of uh, the value addition, agro-industry. And again, within the context concept of uh, multi sectorialism is the acknowledgement of uh, and, and the practical measures to link agriculture to policies on industrialization, policies on the general socioeconomic growth in the country. So those are some of the elements that actually are being identified and we are actually seeing some of them already being pursued in a, in a number of countries within the context of the of the National Agriculture uh, and Food Security Investment Plan. Maybe let me uh, also give you a third one, where the change is going to come from. Because in the same results framework and in the whole pursuit of cut up forward, there's recognition of the role and the power of uh, smallholder farmers and small medium enterprises looking at the complete value chain. And when you talk about small order farmers or family farms, it's actually recognizing where the, the, the magnitude of, of capacity to deliver the levels of agriculture that we're talking about lay. And we are saying that actually the focus uh, and the support to small order farmers, uh, small medium enterprises, is part of the strategy that is going to unlock massive capacity, massive energy to deliver the levels of um, agricultural performance we're talking about. We heard a little bit about the debate between public sector, private sector already. Um, I heard that there was an interjection in the debates that went down to the fact that actually African agriculture is business, not a development cooperation sector as such and it was much applauded. Do you see that there is uh, maybe a little bit of a general criticism about the approach, the sort of state-driven, publicly-driven approach to the whole overhaul of African agriculture? Yes, it's actually something that is coming from traditions that we've built over many decades. Primarily, as you have pointed out, Agriculture has been looked at as a development issue, uh, and uh, in some cases that has meant that uh, looking at agriculture as a way of uh, dealing with and managing uh, poverty and, and rural stability, so to speak, uh, and not really as a business. And therefore you find that, in fact, uh, a lot of interventions in agriculture have been public sector, all the way you look at fertilizer supply, you look at seed supply, you look at uh, uh, extension services. We've built up four or five decades of uh, where government had the monopoly on supporting and providing that kind of support to farming uh, uh, and supported by donors. But if you look at the fertilizer seed uh, support, they were actually never designed to enhance or catalyze growth, let alone business. If you are giving somebody a bag of fertilizer uh, uh, of, of 10 kg and 5 kg seed, you are not actually priming them for an economic activity. It's basically no more than a survival strategy. And that is the situation we have that we, we actually have to deal with. In the, cut up, in the sustaining cut up momentum and the results framework, we have presented that one of the key change in mindset, in strategy, in policies is to look at agriculture as the first and the foremost a means to create wealth for the nation, wealth into the, into the uh, national economy, into the household. Martin, apparently there were a lot of donors at the meeting. Where do you see their role in the future? What should they be doing differently in the future? Considering that there's a lot of talk about the post-2015 changing of development cooperation landscape. And there's at least two pressing problems. That's the still lacking coordination of donors that's interfering with progress. 
and there's also still a lack of capacity development. First and foremost, I'm sure the development partners, the donors, as well as governments, are recognizing the bare truth that uh, the kind of relationships we have seen of donor recipient in the last four or five decades we, uh, are no more. So we're looking at uh, partnerships, we're looking at collaboration, we're looking at alliances, uh, and it's a question of uh, how do you strike the win-win. Number two is that uh, actually we strongly believe that, yes, there can still be a role for donors and the, and the uh, 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 development partners. This is one, recognizing that through CADAP, countries are beginning to be clear, assertive, and firm in terms of an agenda. So there is an agenda on agriculture development. So the first thing for development partners and donors is to recognize and support, underline along this agenda and even support the countries to strengthen the articulation of what is this agenda and, and ensure issues around coherence, around harmonization, alignment, are actually adhered to both by the development partners, donors, as well as the, uh, the various partners within countries and stakeholders in the country. The third one is, is then uh, how do we support systemic capacity? You were talking about the policy formulation. I think we, we are also clear that, in fact, in the countries where there is seemingly a lot of impact on, on the policy practice, is coming from enabling those policy design processes, policy practice processes, to be more inclusive, to be more linked to evidence, uh, facts and figures, and therefore enhancing the analytical capacity, the access to information along those processes that uh, facilitate policy practice is actually how we can intervene. I think uh, this is important in the context that uh, uh, everybody has to recognize that policy formulation is an inherent, uh, to a very extent, sovereign issue that is actually happening, whatever way you look at it, is actually going on. And many times in the forms and the labels where the word policy doesn't even appear. Thank you very much.